Great to be here. So I'm going to talk about frontiers of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And you know, some of the stuff I'll talk about may be uh, technical, but I hope I can keep everybody excited throughout this and bring you to why AI and machine learning is so important for Uber's mission towards the end of the talk. So um, I come from the field of machine learning. Machine learning is an interdisciplinary field um, focusing on both the mathematical foundations and practical applications of systems that learn from data. And probably all of you know this, but well, how does machine learning work? The best way to understand machine learning is to compare it to traditional computer programming. So in traditional computer programming, you give the computer detailed instructions for what to do, kind of like a recipe. And that's a very sort of uh, predictable process, but it's very fragile in some ways. In machine learning, what we do is we give computers data, examples of inputs and outputs, and an algorithm that finds patterns in the data. And this results in a more statistical, less predictable, more robust pattern matching behavior. Now, there are a lot of terms thrown around, um, and I've been in this field for long enough to encounter all of these. And I, this is a busy slide from a colleague of mine at Cambridge, Richard Turner. But I think it's really interesting to think about it. So um, we have the theoretical foundations of the field. Okay? And the theoretical foundations include things like statistics. Statistics is the mathematics of understanding patterns in data. But also, many of the ideas in signal processing, machine learning, including deep learning, and so on, um, are part of the theoretical foundations. And you know they range from simple models that statisticians tend to like, because we can analyze them and understand them, to much more complex models like you know, deep neural networks and so on, which are just statistical models of some kind, but with many, many parameters. Now, uh, on this side of this slide, what you can see is downstream application areas. And it used to be that AI was not fashionable. Nobody said they did AI because we had an AI winter. People thought it was embarrassing to claim that you're doing AI. So people said, oh, we're doing data science. We're sort of extracting um, patterns out of data or data mining, things like that. Or even just the, the exercise of doing science is part of like analyzing and understanding patterns in data. So ex if your goal is to extract value or knowledge from data, you'll probably say you do data science. If your goal is to recreate intelligent behavior, you might say you work in AI or machine intelligence. But again, from a theoretical foundation, they're all basically using the same concepts and tools. OK, so that's where all these things live. Now, in machine learning, we have a bunch of canonical problems that um, uh, people solve over and over again. These are things like classification, telling cats from dogs, uh, regression, you know, predicting the stock market tomorrow from the prices today, uh, clustering, for example, organizing your news stories into groups of similar news stories, or reinforcement learning, which involves uh, creating a decision-making agent that takes actions in an environment and improves its behavior. For example, if you're trying to get computers to beat you at Atari games. Now, um, it's an incredibly exciting time for the field of machine learning. And the reason it's exciting is because of all of the different applications of machine learning and AI technology. We have applications, for example, like uh, all of the speech and language technologies, automatic speech recognition, machine translation, dialogue systems. These things are, have been around for decades, but uh, we now are at a stage where they're uh, certainly commercially viable and changing entire industries. Um, and uh, you know, this is an area I'll mention very briefly, but this is an area that's important for us at Uber as well, because we want to have more natural interaction with all of our uh, customers, the riders, drivers, eaters, et cetera. Um, we have computer vision, object, face, handwriting recognition, image captioning. This is a very old slide of a primitive computer vision system. Um, something a bit fancier is what's living in all of your phones right now. That little box that appears around faces is running a machine learning algorithm. Something even more fancier was the 
this work um, done a few years ago uh, on image captioning where you just give the computer uh, images and uh, it produces captions that are quite plausible for those images. And of course, there's no magic there, even though it felt like magic to a lot of people out there. The magic is if you have, you know, hundreds of, or tens or hundreds of millions of examples of images, for example, from Flickr, where people have entered text captions, you can build a statistical model that relates the pixels in an image with the text that might be plausible. And it's certainly not flawless, and it certainly doesn't really understand what's in the images. Um, Machine learning is also having a tremendous impact in the sciences. Just, you know, maybe this is not focused right here, but uh, in biology, uh, genomics, in uh, chemistry, in astronomy, in all of these scientific fields, people are using machine learning or AI technologies to help them understand their data. Um, machine learning is underlying all recommender systems that you interact with all the time. Machine learning drives autonomous vehicle research, which of course is something that Uber is uh, one of the world leaders at. But you know the field of autonomous uh, vehicles has been around for many, many years. That's a slide from 1989 about Alvin, a self-driving car built at CMU, driving 70 miles an hour on a highway uh, with a tiny little neural network with four hidden units in the image. So that's a pretty scary proposition, I would say. Um, machine learning underlies a lot of robotics. This is an image from one of my colleagues at Uber, uh, Jeff Kloon, who um, had a paper in, in the scientific uh, magazine Nature on robots that can heal themselves after damage using machine learning techniques. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of you know, the advances in computer games, for example, from DeepMind, learning to play Atari games at world, uh, at superhuman level, or Go at world-beating levels, or again, this is uh, another game which I think is maybe even more interesting, poker, uh, machine learning and AI methods, uh, beating humans at poker, a game that involves uh, bluffing, deception, and a bit of psychology. So that's pretty interesting to me. And of course, the whole financial industry is uh, having a love-hate relationship with machine learning and AI technologies over the last couple of decades. So um, they're being used all over the place. So why has there been an explosion of applications of AI and machine learning methods in the last few years? Um, underlying this explosion are a few basic things. Not necessarily a lot of cleverness. Honestly, huge amounts of data, um, better algorithms, a little bit better algorithms, and large amounts of compute. And also, the excitement has meant that the field, um, both in industry and academia, has exploded. And so, of course, you know, if you have 20 times as many people in an area, you will advance, um, hopefully, you know, 20 times as quickly. Now, what are the foundations of AI and machine learning? This is where I'm going to do a bit of a technical deep dive. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, has been driving a lot of thinking in this field has been uh, AI inspired by the human brain. OK, so let me see. I can be inspired by the human brain, but I can't get the clicker to work. Um, I will shake it and bring it closer. Aha, uh -huh, there we are. It's probably going to go five slides now. OK, so AI inspired by the human brain. Now, many people are excited about this. They talk about this. It's all over the media. And uh, you know, if we're going to talk about AI inspired by the human brain, let's step back for a couple of minutes and just think about what's the function of our brains, OK? Well, the brain is an information processing organ. It takes data in the form of our senses, it lays down memories, it processes them, and it produces actions, okay? So that's basically what the brain is, one of the organs of the body. Um, but let's be a little bit more precise. If the brain is an information processing organ, well, what do we mean by information? I mean, that's a pretty technical concept. It's a concept that obviously underlies all of computer science as well. So information is the reduction of uncertainty, and it's measured in bits. 
um, one bit corresponds to the answer to a yes or no question with equal probabilities. And that's what that's all information is. Okay, so brain is an information processing organ. Um, well, how much information is there in a typical human brain? Can we even quantify that? Brains are incredibly complex. Hundreds of billions of neurons, thousands or tens of thousands of connections. Of course, you could count however many atoms there are in the brain, but how many bits of information are there in a human brain? Well, there are only two ways information can get into a human brain. Um, through our DNA and through our senses. Now, the DNA, our human genome, we can quantify the number of bits there. There are about three billion base pairs. Each base can take one of four states. Uh, so if you just calculate that up, um, it's basically less than one gigabyte. Okay? It's one USB stick. For all those people excited about genomics and so on, human genome, way, way less than uh, one very old memory stick, one memory stick that might look like that. Um, and what about our senses? So the rest, the bulk of the information in the brain, now information, what I'm talking about here is the mutual information for the nerds out there, the mutual information between the inside of your brain and the outside, okay? That's all, every, every sort of other bit of randomness in the brain is irrelevant, okay? So the rest of it comes from the senses. And in the senses, well, the way uh, you can estimate this is imagine, again, a few, from a few years ago, you're watching, your life was like watching DVD quality movie for your waking time. So that would be an hour can be compressed into about 400 megabytes, uh, 16 hours a day, 365 days a year, pick a, a lifespan of, say, 80 years. That's 200,000 gigabytes or 200 terabytes, but that's all of the raw information uh, coming in through our senses. And actually, you know, you don't really store or represent every detail of everything you saw and everything you heard. Every pixel of your, you know, visual experience is not stored in your brain. And even a very generous estimate that says maybe 1% of that uh, information is stored in your brain would give us something like two terabytes. So give or take a factor of 10 if you want. But two terabytes, again, reminding you, that's like an old hard drive. So memory stick and a hard drive, that's what, you know, that's what the information content of a human brain is. All this human-inspired AI, just think of that. So AI is not really limited by, you know, uh, our memory or you know, uh, our memory storage cap capacity by any means. Okay, so let's step back and think about AI inspired by the human brain. Next time somebody talks to you about AI inspired by the human brain, keep in mind that the human brain stores very little information about the world. Um, also, human reasoning is pretty flawed. We're terrible decision makers. We're really bad at estimating probabilities and uncertainty and risk. Uh, we have very little short-term memory to work with. Our perception is pretty limited. We've evolved to see certain kinds of patterns that were useful uh, in our primate evolution, but many other patterns escape our perceptual system. Human communication is pathetic. You know, the bandwidth of me talking to you is, uh, you know, way less than an old modem, okay? And, uh, you know, in some ways, computers are already way better than us at many, many things. AI is here. It's just that we're not, we're not like calling it AI. We're just saying, oh, you know, AI is what humans do that computers still can't do. We just don't want to admit it. Now, um, I mean, I feel like this is, I don't want to be negative. Humans are amazing. We do incredible things that computers still can't do. So there's definitely inspiration there but it's not like some pinnacle of intelligence. Um, so we should move beyond the era of human-centric AI and think about the potential for AI to solve problems that humans uh, are not good at. So to complement humans, that's what I think. Now, ironically, um, the advances in AI, a lot of them have come around from this field of deep learning, which is really neurally inspired um, 
uh, machine learning architectures that take something like you know, images or text or so on and produce some output, in, like for example, labels. And neural networks are just tunable nonlinear functions with many parameters. The function goes from inputs to outputs through multiple stages of computation. That's why they're called deep. And uh, the weights connecting the neurons are tuned to reduce errors over time. So although deep learning has been one of the biggest driving forces of the AI uh, revolution, uh, one of the important things is to realize their limitations. Uh, deep learning methods are very data hungry and compute intensive. They're poor at representing uncertainty. They're uninterpretable black boxes, so they're very difficult to trust. They're not very transparent. They're easily fooled by adversarial examples. If you haven't seen it, uh, here's an example. So you have a school bus, you add a bit of noise, and the neural network confidently um, uh, says that it's an ostrich. You, you have a picture of a dog, you add another little bit of noise, and the neural net confidently says it's an ostrich. And you can turn any image into an ostrich by adding a little bit of noise. Okay. Uh, worse yet, you can take stop signs mis and misclassify them as speed limit 45 um, by just putting some white and black stickies on it. So that's not robust. And one way of getting around that robustness problem is uh, something that I'm really passionate about and that relates to Uber's AI mission. And that is probabilistic machine learning. So uh, probabilistic machine learning is uh, the idea of trying to represent uncertainty correctly in our AI systems. That's what underlies it. And it goes back to Reverend Thomas Bayes, who we have here from the 18th century, who came up with something called Bayes' Rule, which is basically a way of uh, turning uh, data into knowledge about hypotheses. Okay, so transform the process of transforming from observed data into understanding of hypotheses. And I won't go into, into detail, but you know, uh, when I talk about data, I'm talking about anything that's measurable. And when I talk about hypotheses, I mean everything else, because that's where you, know, you want to reason about things you don't measure from the things that you measure. And sorry about the fuzzy slide, but Probabilistic machine learning is a very simple concept. It, it uh, you know, uh, underlies a lot of thinking about AI systems. Pictorially, one of the ways to understand that is if I was trying to classify those red and blue um, dots uh, with a classification boundary, a traditional system might divide them up like that. But a probabilistic system would consider all the different decision boundaries and it would get more sensible uncertainties about where uh, that boundary is because the amount of data might be limited. So there is a tremendous amount of work in Bayesian deep learning and probabilistic machine learning these days. Uh, this is uh, one of the things that's at the frontier of uh, AI and machine learning, something that uh, we've invested in heavily because we believe it's incredibly important for us. Um, another area that we believe is incredibly important is the automation of a lot of machine learning processes. This is work that um, you know, I started when I was uh, at uh, Cambridge as a uh, professor, uh, and we built a system called the Automatic Statistician, which was basically a system where you can give it data, it searches over models, and it produces um, a report that tells you, uh, you know, what patterns there are in the data. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of these things very quickly. I'm just giving you a flavor of some of the things that I think are particularly exciting. Um, uh, so the automation of data science is exciting. Uh, I'm going to skip over that. There is a live demo where you, you upload some data, and um, you know, the automatic statistician churns away and then produces a report that tells you what patterns there are in the data. Um, Another area that is incredibly important that I think um, it's, uh, it's worth knowing about, at least, is this field called probabilistic programming. So probabilistic programming is um, an area that's focused on building models 
uh, from data that are based on uh, sort of the concept that a model should be a simulation of uh, the data that you might observe. Okay, so you write down a computer program that's a simulator, and then you use machine learning and advanced probabilistic methods to automatically do inference in those models. So another area that um, Uber has, uh, has invested in deeply, uh, we've actually built uh, the first uh, deep universal probabilistic programming language, which brings together deep learning frameworks and probabilistic programming, and we use it for ourselves, and we've open sourced it for the community as well, um, less than a year ago. Um, and so I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, before I get kicked off the stage uh, talking about how all of this machine learning, AI, and so on relates to Uber's business. Now, you're probably all thinking I'm going to talk about self-driving cars, but actually, AI at Uber is much deeper than that. It runs right at the core of our business. Um, in the words of our CEO, Uber is a giant machine intelligence problem. And it's particularly challenging because we're trying to optimize and navigate the real world with all the uncertainty that that brings. So the AI problems at Uber cover space, time, and forecasting at many different uh, spatial and temporal levels of granularity, long-term forecast, short-term forecast, real-time real anomaly detection. Um, we use AI machine learning methods to optimize the market for all of our users. Um, we use these methods to uh, optimize our dispatch, our ETA predictions, uh, our food delivery business, of course, our self-driving cars, in the future, our uh, electric urban aerial ride-sharing service, um, Uber Elevate, which you may have heard about, um, and everywhere else, our customer support, destination prediction, fraud, etc. It's core to Uber's business. And the team that I lead, the AI team at Uber, its mission is basically to infuse AI and machine learning throughout everything we do at Uber to build platforms for the rest of our business. So um, I've kind of said that. Now, I haven't gotten kicked off yet. So let's talk a little bit about the future. I only have a couple more slides. Um, so I'm, in fact, in my notes it says, I'm probably out of time, but I want to reflect on the future. OK, now in the future, I think uh, we clearly will see AI, machine learning, data science, whatever you want to call it, we'll see it really revolutionizing the sciences. And with that, we'll get advances in all sorts of discoveries that I think will be fantastic for society. Um, Self-driving cars are a real thing. You guys probably all believe it a few years ago. There was more skepticism. It is difficult. It's a difficult AI problem. Um, you know, we will not stay on ground. We will go to the skies as well, and there are plenty of AI problems there. Um, you've experienced personal assistance and toys. Maybe they don't look so scary, but I definitely believe that this, these will continue to impact our lives. And I'll call out uh, personalized, uh, precise medicine as another fantastic application where we can bring AI methods together with uh, traditional medicine and biology. So I just want to leave you with some thoughts, which is, uh, you know, there are all of these amazing companies and you know technologies that are revolutionizing our world, but all of this has impacts. So we should think about and mitigate those impacts, we should, as a society, plan towards uh, doing the right thing with our impacts. And these impacts are both positive and negative. Productivity, employment, healthcare, the way cities and transport work, energy, climate, sustainability, our political systems, how governments relate to people, financial systems, education, and so on. And uh, I just want to leave you with that thought. We all want to advance the field of AI, but we should definitely make sure that we do it in a socially responsible way and that our technologies are improving lives for people around the world. Thanks.
Thank you. No